It's seven o'clock. Let's get to it. It's Topical Starts right now. A very good evening to you, South Africa, those watching around the world. My name is Blaine Herman, and this is It's Topical. Our digital audience with us tonight, they'll be joining us in a short while, looking forward to getting their take on our topic in a short while. Death, be not proud. The air is heavy with grief tonight. Why? And it's for various reasons. In Naledi Soweto, children being laid to rest. Still, a lot of unknowns. The exact cause of their deaths are being investigated. This story will no doubt remain on our radar until we find out why these promising, precious lives were cut short. Also, news that came as a shock to many. The passing of former governor of the South African Reserve Bank and Labor and Finance Minister, Tito Mboweni. He passed away following a short illness. He was 65 years old. Described by President Cyril Ramaphosa as an activist, an economic policy innovator, a champion of labor rights. What void does he leave behind? Which brings us to the question of the week. And we're asking you, what stood out for you in the life and career of the former minister and Reserve Bank Governor, Tito Mboweni? Let us know at SABC underscore TV. So as tributes continue to pour in for former Finance Minister Tito Mboweni, his former special advisor in 1994, when he was appointed Minister of Labour, Leslie Mastorp, says Mboweni played a vital role in cementing the monetary and fiscal policy framework in South Africa. This is what he had to say. Let me start by expressing my deepest condolences to the family of uh, Tito Mboweni, as well as his close uh, friends, the Friends Network more broadly, as well as his comrades in the African National uh, Congress. I've known Tito Mboweni for the last 34 years, having met him soon after the unbanning of, of the ANC. He played, as we all know, a very critical and crucial role in the design of the modern economic policy framework of uh, South Africa. Tito played a vital role in developing young policymakers, people like myself and, and many others who in the early uh, 90s were inspired by him and the leadership of, of the ANC to study economic policy, to go and obtain master's degrees, and some people obtain PhD degrees. And he really um, made us believe in ourselves, uh, but, uh, inspired us to want to be world class and operate at the highest level, whether it be at the G20, World Economic Forum annual meetings, the IMF and, and then the World Bank uh, meetings and so on. Tito elevated South Africa's stature in international uh, economic policy making. Uh, South Africa played in the Premier League as a result of his sharp mind and uh, intellect. We will miss him, but he has, reached, he has left a lasting legacy in the economic policy fabric of South Africa. All right, we've got lots to discuss. Let's get on with the discussion. We've gathered the better minds at the SABC here to explore the various aspects of Tito Mboweni. We have Sophie Mokwena, SABC News International Editor, as well as SABC Political Editor, Mzondi Limbeche. To both of you, thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's important to have your perspective on this because you both have worked or followed his career at various stages of his life. He gave off, no doubt, a sense of vitality, um, obviously prolific on, on social media. Sentiment on the ground, what are you hearing, Sophie? Well, I think uh, one thing that happened last night when the news uh, broke, we saw people more united, mm. particularly talking about the different roles that uh, Tito Mboweni was engaged in, and also the sense of humor, mm. as you spoke about the skills in relation to uh, cooking. And right. so you saw young and old talking about this man, and not only inside the country, but outside the country as well. As you know that uh, he went to Lesotho, yeah. uh, and where he 
graduated and of course it is in that country where he also gets support for further education in terms of going abroad linking with the African National Congress in Tanzania to right. get a, a, a support and scholarship then went to the United Kingdom where he met uh, the former president of the ANC O.R. Tambo right. and the former president uh, Tabo Mbegi. Therefore people were just talking about Tito, a human being, right. a minister of labor, the first governor of the Reserve Bank post-1994 oh. black, and also talking about Tito, the finance minister, the controversies around the economic policies, and right. also how firm and feisty he was. You spoke about that aspect of his personality in terms of humor. Uh, so I, just before I come to you, uh, Control, cue up that uh, clip. We had him, remember, uh, on the program in June, just before the cabinet mm -hmm. was announced, talking about this new government arrangement. Um, and something that he spoke about, uh, Mzwai, was the, the issue of getting everybody on the same page and how it's going to work with regards to the executive, how it's going to work with regards to the legislature. We'll get that clip in a short while, but talk to us about how he saw himself within the new di dispensation, how his career changed over the years. Uh, a very good evening to you, Blaine and uh, Sophie, and obviously the viewers. I think one, one of the takeaways really from um, the late minister and uh, the late governor of the Reserve Bank uh, is that he lived the way, the, the life, the way he wanted to. Right. Uh, it didn't matter uh, what sort of um, uh, responsibilities he had. Of course, he would discharge those, those responsibilities, but he was always uh, within what he wanted to do. Right. I mean, how many people will just decide and go to the president and say, you know, Mr. President, I think I've done enough, so right. do you want to release me? Yeah. So yeah. because it's seen as the post job, and, and uh, I mean, I'm not even going to speak about uh, some of the things that he was doing or the clothes and stuff like right. that. So he basically projected himself the way he wanted to. He was an intellectual. He was quite brilliant. Yes. I mean, he understood his stuff. And then not lost on him, he knew that uh, he he possessed that so now he, he wasn't scared by anything right I mean even those controversies he would just shoot from the hip yes and he would get the opportunity to do some of those things it wouldn't be possible it during our conversation I thought I heard him <laughs> say that he was interested in the job uh, this was back in June just before the cabinet was announced so I asked him a question with regards to whether he's interested this is what he had to say take a look Is that me hearing you putting your hand up for a position in cabinet? <laughs> I think I'll make sure that my phone is switched off. <laughs> when, when he was appointed finance minister, did he take that reluctantly? I think it happened at the time where he did not have a choice to oh. say no. Remember, they are schooled in a particular oh. way uh, from the Congress movement where you get assigned responsibilities, where you get deployed to yeah. do certain responsibilities. Here was an emergent situation. Remember, and Tantanen had been appointed oh. to that situation, oh. but uh, because of the controversy around what has been, had been happening at the Zondo Commission, so he had to step aside. And then the president, I mean, th that's a key portfolio. And then the president needed someone who the markets were quite used to, not right. only the markets, but someone who understood that kind of a role. So he then immediately um, plugged into that role, uh, I think effortlessly. Yes. And I think what I remember, Blaine and Sophie, about this is that um, it was just a few days before there was to be a... a, 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 a a, a, a budget speech. Uh, it was a few days. It was a budget speech, right. and then I remember when after after delivering that budget speech, people were saying, "So, did you have to um, uh, learn a lot from right. this?" He said, "No, you know, because I understand. I understand this area, yeah. so it was easier for me to craft it." Right. Um, you're not seeing things. We brought in another guest. We want to expand this conversation. Journalists are never. Late. They always <laughs> delayed. <laughs> it's, uh, Willem said EMTN is SABC specialist researcher. Thank you, sir, for, for your time. I'm going to come to you with regards to uh, Mboweni's play in the world of economics. Uh, but uh, um, uh, Sophie, so I said something interesting in terms of how he was schooled. And we know that he, he did 
uh, schooling in Lesotho as well in terms of tertiary. Um, talk to us about how, and I, w when I look at his career, that's where you kind of figure out that that's where economics intersected with politics, you know. Uh, how, talk to us about his relationship with the Mountain Kingdom. Yes, the professor who uh, assisted Tito Mboweni at uh, Roma University then, and now called the National University of Lesotho, uh, spoke about uh, how at that moment when he was doing a degree in politics, particularly focusing on the region, the frontline states, and how he was helping him. At that yeah. time, that included economic issues, but going to London, or going to UK and abroad, getting education, it started there. And that's where he is confident or convinced yeah. that that's where he became even more interested in economics. Now, meeting Tabombegi, the economist mm. who studied at Sussex, Sussex yeah. and you know when you engage in Begi, it takes hours and hours and hours and you come out there having a different uh, view of issues. Right. And I think at that moment also, that engagement with Mbegi contributed to his interest in economics. Right. And when he was sent to Zambia, at the ANC offices in Zambia, where he was uh, responsible for economic issues, him participating in the drafting of ready to govern and this is a document outside uh, the country before ANC yeah. uh, became uh, the governing party. Uh, he was involved in that and therefore you can see where it all started and when one thing that uh, Professor Suhai uh, Santo said mm -hmm. was that when he was the Minister of Labour he requested the professor from Lesotho uh, to support him in that department and they drafted a document uh, that speaks to you know social compact right. and that word will you remember yes. social compact yes. that's exactly what the president now is talking about and they included in that work the labor organizations such as NUM yes. you can imagine the role that that, that you can think of in terms of uh, also the former right. uh, uh, NUM uh, secretary right. or general secretary Cyril Ramaphosa and Bontate James Mutlatsi. So you can see that he met many people yeah. along the way who influenced his uh, way of uh, paving way for his yeah. career. But generally, he really liked uh, the issues that are related to economics. That is why even today right. he's sitting on or he was in the boards of different companies, yeah, companies. but also an organization on the continent yeah. that's looking at the economic issues uh, in a pan-Africanist right. uh, uh, ideology in terms of building the continent. I will touch on that in, in a short while. Very instrumental, obviously, in NEDLAC as well. Um, talk to us, Veli. Look, he was he was uh, Reserve Bank Governor for a decade, yeah. former Finance Minister. What's your understanding with regards to his approach to fiscal discipline as well as economic transformation? Sure, I don't know where to start. <coughs> uh, um, but when he was a colossal figure when it comes to the world of macroeconomic policy, when it came to the world of uh, public finance management. Um, I think the biggest challenge that uh, the 1994 generation had <coughs> was to balance a number of issues, the changing global mm. landscape in terms of ideological setup. You had a situation where the, the, the Soviet Union that had supported the arms struggle was collapsing and most of the liberation fighters were schooled in that economics. But now you had the guys like Tito Mboweni at a very tender age of 35 years who understood the importance of aligning uh, properly when it comes to the future of macroeconomic policy, which now it is evident that it's been shaped by and large by neoliberal approach. And when it comes to that, he never lost his conscience in terms of ensuring that while we are 
pushing for a microeconomic policy that aligns with a, a, a macroeconomic policy that is uh, globally uh, sound, if I may use, because at that time, capitalism seemed to be the way that was bringing success. Mm. And South Africa as a state that was emerging from apartheid, they needed to balance that to ensure that when we go in there, we don't go with uh, policies that are going right. to collapse the country, but at the same time, we can't go hardcore on neoliberal economic right. policies. So there had to be a balance. So for me, he stood uh, out for that because he was young, but he understood global, di global dynamics in terms yes. of the uh, economic setup. But at the same time, he was very, very uh, caring when it comes to addressing the socio-economic yes. needs of that uh, young democracy called South Africa at the time. It's interesting you mentioned that. Um, so I, with regards to his approach, not everybody agreed with his mm. policy ideas. The EFF released a statement uh, today talking about they had their differences, but what they admired about him is that he wasn't shy to engage in robust debate. Talk to us about how his policy ideas resonated with political parties. Yeah, in fact, <laughs> I'm actually reminded of uh, when we look at, at, at policy, uh, I think it was just before he joined government, um, I think in 2018, yeah. when he tweeted, he basically said, uh, why don't you, I think, nationalize the uh, mm. post bank? Mm. Mm. You know, and it came out of the mm. blue. And then you, 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 you looked at this individual who you've always thought he, 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 he behaves in a particular way. Right. But interestingly, plain is that uh, in a few months, he was to be appointed uh, the finance minister. And then people started asking questions to say, okay, this is what you told us. Are you yeah. going to do it now? Right. So clearly, he was operating in an environment really where you are guided uh, by certain uh, conditions. Um, because you can't, I mean, sometimes you can't believe in, in a particular right. project, but uh, it has to operate within a bigger project right. where you have to align with others. Uh, I see so yes, he wants to come in yeah, there. I think yeah. in the 90s, uh, there was a time where he was engaging media at that time. And he spoke about this issue where he pointed out to the journalists then that uh, uh, the, the, the issue of uh, socialism or the way you think about mm. Russia and, and China, it is because people believe in it mm. because of their circumstances. Mm. If you don't change the lives of the poor and the marginalized, this is the route for them. But he also pointed out that when they come in, or what needs to happen with South Africa in terms of reforms and changes, you have to focus on building a strong domestic uh, 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 the economy, right. the reliant not only on foreign direct investment, but also on people in yeah. the country investing in that economy, and then you create jobs. Then you find a way when you give guarantee to the labor organizations in terms of job security to manage issues of salaries and all right. of that. But secondly, he, 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 he also when Zoy spoke about that uh, message on social media, he was saying the politicians must look at establishing a state bank. Mm, mm. And now we are told mm. it's happening. Secondly, he spoke about 40% that must be owned by states right. in terms of minerals. So it wasn't 100%. And I think you are correct to say he, at times he was trying to balance uh, different interests. Yeah. But the reality is this is someone who grew up in the countryside, poor background, understood the plight of the poor. And that is yeah. why in the 90s, already he was talking about you can't just criticize yeah, people yeah. who believe in socialism when so many people are poor and look at china today well let's hear from the community uh Veli, before i come to you the community of zanin in limpopo in particular where the late uh, minister titumboweni hailed from they've expressed of course sadness right uh about his passing the residents say that they are no doubt mourning with his family I was saddened about the passing of Tito Mboweni. I would like to send words of condolences to the Mboweni family. The untimely passing on of um, our beloved dear brother, leader, mentor, and, and, and our family member, uh, Gov Tito Mboweni, last night was a very sad news for us. And we felt very disturbed 
I'm very saddened by Titombo when he's passing. My condolences to his family. God says he's close to those with broken heart. God loves them. We love you and we also loved him too. I learned about his passing last night. He was a good trust with finance minister. To the Mbaweni family, you are not alone in this difficult situation. To the word on the street, we also took our cameras out to the streets of Johannesburg this morning to gauge people's views on Tito Mboweni. This is what they had to say. Tito Mboweni was such a gentleman, man, especially when he was a finance minister. Every time when we listen to him, uh, his budget speech, you could tell that something was going to change. So now since he's gone, -ish, but I hope other members or ANC members have learned a lot from, from him as well as other upcoming uh, politicians. He was a corrupt free man. I've never heard of a scandal of him. Even if you follow him on Twitter, he was like like cooking and his, <coughs> his shoes. Yeah, I think he always had a, an educated, um, researched position on whatever issues he was addressing. Um, sometimes he took a strong stand and was not always popular, but uh, I think he was uh, a man of his convictions and um, you know, he certainly stood out. I was really shocked. I think Tito is someone who is so like, despite all the work he's done, he's also been really fun on Twitter with all his recipes. Um, and I think he added a very personal touch with that, you know. We don't often get to interact with our ministers and with like the political space, but he brought a fun element to it. And when he told me this morning, I was like, ah, oh, the recipes, we're gonna miss all of that. I follow him, I'm a big admirer, so I follow him on social media. He always posts his uh, culinary uh, experiences with us. So um, I was really saddened by his death. It, it came as a shock. I really admire that gentleman. He was a really professional man, highly regarded, respected, and I was one of the people who really thought high of him indeed. We do appreciate your views. Lots more to discuss. We're going to flesh out these various aspects of his life in a short while. Stay with us. back we're talking about the life and times of Tito Mboweni you're watching it's topical it's the topical story today so we have to get on it and give you context that's what this program is all about to help you better understand what this person meant in the context of South Africa's political as well as economic uh, dispensation tenure period and then better understand how we can get to better. It's important. Let's bring in our digital audience now. They've been joining us from various parts of the country. Uh, I want to start with uh, Zippo. Zippo, uh, your thoughts, uh, your impressions about Tito Mboweni and the legacy he le leaves behind. Thank you very much, Blaine. Um, just to start off, to send condolences to um, Mr. Mboweni's family. Um, but for me, I want to say that his career to myself is more of a career where there's a lot of, all, it's all sizzle but no steak. Um, if you look at it, you are a young Labour minister um, at 35 years old. Um, you, the most significant thing that you do is help our labor, uh, draft our labour laws that we have currently. But I'd love to ask South Africans, what do they currently feel about those labour laws? Are they really helping them materially? Mm. Then you move on to your um, days as a governor, first black governor, a lot of sizzle, a lot of excitement. But the only memorable thing most South Africans will say they have of that is that um, he inspired Casper Nyovesta's hit song, <laughs> Tito Mboweni. So it's, 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 at the end of the day, we need to start holding leaders um, to higher account to say, OK, what are they actually doing materially? I'm hearing um, the, the, the guests in, in the studio um, but for me, I, I think Tito Mboweni, out of every politician in this country, had the, the best opportunity to uh, deliver a state bank for this country. 
you the governor of a reserve bank and you the finance minister you have understanding on the legislative side and you have understanding on 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 how um what it takes to create a bank and to make it functional so for me if i sum all of that up yes very well educated man very likable man but what material um, um achievements did he achieve right. that changed the, the 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 life of the south african materially all sizzle no steak really says zippo um i was listening to some comments made by uh, safta's general secretary zulin zimavavi who was talking about the basic uh conditions of employment act um and how those that kind of act all those terms and conditions within that act wouldn't be possible if it didn't have a sympathetic minister of labor talking about Tito Mbuweni. Talk to us about how what Zippo said marries with the work that he's done. Well, let's also, just to go a little bit back, um, Mbuweni was, uh, comes from as a golden uh, generation of that time when it comes to, uh, as I said, looking at the economic policy and also looking at the socio-economic challenges that the country was facing. So as a Minister of Labor at the time, we understand that we came from an apartheid background where the rights of uh, workers weren't as heightened as they were supposed to be. There was a lot of abuse and there was a lot of, uh, uh, should I say, uh, environment that was not conducive for workers. Mm. So the bringing in of that basic conditions of employment act, it served to ensure that whoever does business as a, as, as, a, as a businessman in South Africa, as an employer, they have a set of rules in which they need to adhere to. Yet at the same time, it provided workers with a comfort of knowing that when they give their labor, it's not going to be an exploitative manner in which right. it was happening previously. So that was very important. But also another point is during that time there was a formation of NEDLAC, mm, so mm. which brought in several partners when it comes to business, economics and labor. It was important at the time because the interests were yeah. so much different. You would understand that with the labor side of things, they were advocating for socialist uh, perspective on how things are supposed to be done. Yet business was scared that if that uh, policy is advanced right. at the expect of balancing uh, the macroeconomic policy landscape, it was going to be a problem. Yet at the same time, you needed to bring them together to the table to say, for the labor, what are your expectations right. and what are you bringing into the table for the future of South Africa as business? What is it that are going to change? What is it that are going to put to ensure that you ease the, the fear of the right. workers to say, we have been uh, abused, we have been exploited previously. And then also when it comes to the investment, yes. it brought a lot of confidence uh, for investors because we understand that in, in the economy, if you have if you lose the, the, the confidence of the markets, uh, you are skating on a very thin ice, yeah. that you, you're on a slippery slope, where your, your economy may collapse at any time. So for him to come up with that net, not only him, but uh, to be a force mm. to ensure that net uh, started at that time was very important. But again, the issue of CC, uh, CCMA. Right. I mean, most workers did not have uh, a platform where they could voice their uh, concerns when they felt that they have been unfairly treated. So yes. at that time, a lot of progressive policies came, basic conditions of right. employment act, institutions like CCMA, NETLEC, that shows that the man had a vision and the man could see that we needed a balance to go to the future. I wonder how that vision played out on the continent as well as in the global stage. Um, he was appointed as part of the AU Reforms Advisory Committee under Paul Kagame. Uh, it's basically aimed at improving the conditions so that the organization can you know tackle challenges on the continent uh, talk to us about his role on the continent sophie well uh, there was a time where the au took a decision to ask the rwandan president paul kagame to set up or to come up with recommendations in terms of how the au can transform and he set up this committee uh, it was uh, composed of a very uh, senior seasoned uh, s Africans mm. on the continent that included people like uh, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Dr. Amina Mohammed. Mm -hmm. He was part of that. And after they made all those recommendations, one of the recommendations was that uh, there must be a peace fund so that the peacekeeping, you fund those projects you don't rely on external uh, funders that might have vest interest 
on the continent mm. and uh, abuse the resources that they they inject on the continent to arrive at their own personal interest as countries outside the continent. So he was the chairperson of that uh, uh, peace fund. Right. And a uh, few weeks ago, he actually had a meeting and he had uh, been able to get funds for that uh, job to ensure that you have peacekeeping forces mm -hmm. on the continent where there are hotspots and that is funded on the continent because one thing that was uh, pointed out after that uh, in work of Kagame was that you can't rely on yeah. external funders to fund the AU right. because the issue of uh, influence will continue and therefore mm. he he was part of that but also returning to the colleague or the uh, the, the, the the contribution that what what did he do when he was labor what did he yeah. do as reserve bank when you look at the reserve bank in particular when he went there 88 percent mm. of management mm. was white and already male you can understand transforming the yeah. institution was a difficult task the other issue when he uh, went back to finance uh, you'd recall that there was a time in 2008 there was economic meltdown right. and uh, Clearly, he would come up with the policy that didn't uh, sit well with Labour and other people who saw those uh, policies as neoliberal. Right. And therefore, it's true that uh, there were criticism. But the question is, was he available to engage with people and hear them out? And that's exactly what uh, yeah. uh, Floyd Shivambo today said, that much as we differed on policies, he was able yeah. to engage us. He even helped me with my master's degree at VETS. The same with Malema, who has just released yeah. a video talking about the relationship, but also pointing out that uh, there were sharp differences. Criticism notwithstanding, Mzwai, um, and no doubt some of these policy ideas rub people up the wrong way. Uh, towards the end of his life and his career, his political career, talk to us about his stance within the ANC. Was he liked? Was he respected? Well, I think as a person who was really well known and his contribution very well known, um, you'd always have, because the ANC now has factions, mm -hmm. unfortunately, and you'd, have, you'd always have people who would believe in you and you'd always have people who really uh, uh, don't believe in mm -hmm. you. But, I mean, all around, I think everyone respected the kind of a person he was. In fact, I'm reminded as we are speaking about um, issues around um, uh, the, the, the economy and the, the, and, the, uh, and the divorce, World Economic Forum. Right. You, you know that uh, not many people know that uh, he actually is the one who came up with the nine wasted, wasted years mm -hmm. when he was mm -hmm. a divorce at the World Economic Forum. So he was the kind of a person who was very um, upfront about what he believed in. But at the same time, he is the person who would just go on social media and said, um, referring to the former president, Zuma, for example, he would say, hey, well, let's sit down, let's talk. You yeah. can't do this yeah. to us. Yeah. So it's someone who really, if he felt a particular way, he would just do that. I think that's why uh, the different strengths within yeah. the ANC would somehow uh, respect the kind of a person he was. Right. They may not have liked some of the things that he said or he stood for, but they at least knew uh, what he believed in right. without uh, him just saying this or that. Yeah, he wasn't afraid to say what he believed. And he also questioned uh, the, the, the term mm -hmm. of the government of national unity, yeah. um, calling it something different. Uh, he was on this very show questioning how this is being framed. Let's go now to our digital audience. Let's get more insight and in some of their uh, experiences or the impressions of the man known as Titum Boweni. Uh, Mpo, let's talk to you. Your thoughts. Of course. Um, I think one of the things that he'll always be remembered for was his feisty leadership. Mm -hmm. um, I think people knew him as somebody who was very blatant and didn't really know how to sugarcoat things, which I think sometimes um, did play against him. Um, some of the things that we obviously would remember him for was the fact that he was very strongly against how often the government would bail out mm -hmm. state enterprises such as your SAA and your um, ESCOM and even advocated at some point for the privatization of those state-owned enterprises which often put him at odds with factions within the ANC and we also know him for reducing the public sector wage bill mm -hmm. which then put him at odds with trade unions as well as workers because critics claimed that 
those austerity measures that he pushed for would negatively affect poor people and the working class disproportionately. So those are some of the things that will always be attached to him. Yeah. But on the other side, do you know that he wanted to champion for economic reforms? And he was very conservative with um, his approach when it came to fiscal matters. Mm -hmm. And then that maybe sometimes led to the trouble in balancing his fiscal discipline with meeting the societal um, needs. Right. You know? And so a question we could pose is, were those policies really effective? Did his conservatism help? Because during his term, unfortunately, the government debt only increased and we didn't see a re uh, reduction in unemployment rates or overall poverty rate in South Africa. So there are those positives and those negatives of his legacy. And then on the other side of things, I think on the lighter note would be a lot of people got to know him beyond politics because of social media, yeah. right? He will always be remembered for his overuse of garlic. And um, <laughs> yeah. terrible there you go. There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we will know him for his very questionable fashion and how he didn't mince his words when it came to either conversing with constituents or even leaders. And I think to an extent there is that need when it comes to politicians. We need that level of honesty, that level of bla um, being blatant. But then there also needs to be an understanding of sensitivity when it comes to certain matters. Right. But overall, I think we will... He, he left a good mark on a lot of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And then much like the late Craven Gordon, there will also be some things that people will always criticize about his leadership. And people will always, like Zipo Zonke did say, um, right. we'll always feel like there was more to do. Yeah. From, yes. Important. thank you very much indeed, Veli. Never minced his words, but he definitely minced the garlic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with uh, Tito Mbaweni, uh, I think it goes with all politicians with, uh, who are very solid when it comes to the school of economics. Uh, it, it's very difficult to please everyone. Let's start there, because as a man who studied economics, mm -hmm. who understood what needed to be done. Fiscal prudence was one of the key things for him. So when it comes to the issue like government bailouts, he questioned a lot that, look, the companies are supposed to be bringing something. The state-owned entities are supposed to be bringing revenue to the state coffers. Mm -hmm. But instead, it's the other way around. It looks like it is government that keeps on pouring money out. And he was very strict on that. I know that uh, unions did not like that because they felt that mm -hmm. if government was not bailing out some SOEs, it would lead to some of them collapsing. But it was very important for him to stand his ground and say, look, if it doesn't bring money to us, why do we keep on pouring mm -hmm. on the bucket that is leaking? And then secondly, when it comes to the issue of him, you know that tweet in 2018 when he proposed about 40% uh, percent ownership of the uh, uh, um, uh, my minerals. Right. It came from a heart that says government needs money at its coffers. But when if we look into our economy, where the money is at, he said the money is at the financial sector, so therefore we needed a state-owned bank. The money is in the mining sector, therefore government needed a bigger chunk of that ownership so that the state coffer will have more funds to use. He was very much against borrowing. Right. Um, at some point in time, he used the, the illustration of a hippo uh, with the jaws. I mean, there was a debt, yeah. uh, so it's going to chow the, right, right, <laughs> the right. funds that are going to be spent on the future. So for me, I would say it goes uh, to the extent that uh, uh, former President Thabo Mbeki sometimes got misunderstood because when you stand mm. strictly on a sound fiscal policy, you are not going to please a lot of people. Right. Also, when you stand very sound on the issue of monetary policy, I mean, uh, Mam Sophie has just mentioned that when he entered the Reserve Bank uh, in, uh, institution, at that time he was a first black uh, uh, governor. It, it must have felt somehow for mm -hmm. those who were controlling the economy at the time to say, this chap perhaps is bringing a lot of changes, but he became very resolute. Right. And uh, he made sure that he introduced proper governance in that in institution while it was transforming, right. but he never compromised in terms of ensuring that uh, the, the, the monetary policy in South Africa becomes independent of politics. Yes, he's a politician, but when he was acting on that role, he wanted to make sure that monetary policy right. becomes independent. I wonder who did he draw from, Sophie, uh, be it on the continent, be it on the world stage, in terms of his political stance, his economic policy stance. Do you have any insight in terms of that? 
Well, I think as I pointed out, he was able to interact with people like O.R. Tambo in terms of uh, the political responsibility that would include the social responsibility. If you hear stories around O.R. Tambo, he was the people's uh, leader and therefore that uh, social part was there. He interacted with people like uh, Tabo Mbegi who is an economist yeah. and therefore he would then have those traits or those uh, instincts of being a shrewd economist and that wouldn't sit well with uh, a certain sector of the society because a society is constituted of different people yeah. with different interests but also in terms of uh, Lesotho again go back to Lesotho the professor is talking about how they worked very close and when I'm talking about the document the pro pro uh, professor spoke about where he compiled a document with some people on the social compact he says if that document was implemented right. at that time, that was linked to the RDP, South Africa wouldn't have been where it is today. So, and, and also in, in some of the interviews in the 90s, he, he, he spoke about a need to ensure that uh, uh, you, 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 you change the lives of the people. Yeah. But of course, when they took power, the ANC, then they had to amend certain approach right. and that didn't sit well with people and it is true that those who were frustrated had a right also to express their views like uh, they've already indicated earlier on the weaknesses mm. but the issue is when you look at the practicality what would you have done mm. sometimes when we talk we must say nah yeah. What could I have done mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. change the situation if I was given that uh, 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 position? I think that's where we have to to be as a nation, yeah. you know, to talk about how do we implement good policies? How do we implement? Not just criticize, but how do we implement? Right. I'm sorry. And it makes it very interesting because, um, as uh, Sophia said, uh, he did get the opportunity mm. of being the finance minister. Mm. So where he said right where the decisions were made. Um, so did he go far enough? Um, what then led him to go to the president to say, yeah. well, I've done enough. Can you just release me? You remember when mm. the president mm. uh, relieved him of that position? It was not the firing. So it was him having requested that he, he needs to be right. uh, released. But of course, uh, having come on the back of all that he had said uh, when he wrote that uh, tweet, it, uh, I think when you look at the records, it was around, around 4 a.m. Yeah. So <laughs> clearly there was something that was bothering him. Mm. And then mm. you get the opportunity to do that. So what is so difficult? Um, mm. Here are your leaders. Uh, here are the people you grew up with. This is the mission when you took over power. This is what you decided you were going to do. Yeah. So what is so difficult about it? And also, which I found interesting, he also felt that uh, perhaps our leaders, uh, by our leaders I mean here in the country, were, were less decisive. That's why time and again he would refer to Paul Kagabe to say, look at how it's done there. Yes. And uh, time and yes. again he will just remind us about Kigali. While other people <laughs> are saying Paul Kagame is a dictator. Exactly. So that's the problem with leadership. Yes. Uh, mm. you, you, you can't always be right, yeah. which is uh, correct in yeah. terms of being a human and yeah. making mistakes. But do you listen? Mm. But I think the point um, uh, which he was trying to make, I think um, um, uh, Mboen was that, so as uh, someone who is in charge, you need to be decisive about where you want to go. I mean, look at where um, not you can, Rwanda is mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not necessarily like the manner in which um, their democracy plays out, right. because uh, I, I don't know a lot of democracies where it produces 99% yeah. uh, of, of the outcome, but it's happening there, right. and you can see where they're going. You may disagree with it, but decisive, they are definitely. Right. And when he tweeted about that, I think he had things like those in mind. All right, let's bring back our digital audience. Um, let's bring back Mailola as well as Lungile. Mailola, to you first. Uh, good evening to everyone in studio as well as at home. So with me as a young person, young student who's going into the finance industry, for me, when it comes to uh, I feel like what has happened now is that 
we have lost a well of knowledge. And for me, Ndate Tito Mbaweni, in terms of his qualities, he was a leader without, with or without positions. Meaning for me, he stood out as a person that right. communicates that you don't need to be in a certain position in order for you to be a leader. And I think uh, another thing is... One thing in terms of the transfer of knowledge, one question I have is how do we then transfer these knowledge of the mm. people who are who have this experience to the younger people, which is us so that we can make our own decisions essentially. How do we capture and transfer the information to the next generation? Because I feel there's not a lot of knowledge transferation essentially. Mm. Good point. Uh, Lungile, let's hear from you. Thank you, Herman. Indeed, there's a country we have lost an icon, including internationally. The men who have the sense of Ubuntu, you can hear people there interacting with him on Twitter, social media. He was there for everyone. He was the government of the people. I would also like to indicate three items which I will communicate with. It's the issue of labor during his tenure as the minister. Right. He ensured that he, ad he advanced the rights of the employees because he also promulgated the Employment Equity Act. Is there today everyone is enjoying those constitutional rights. Right. We also so, you know, go we have to during... There because I think there's some inter interference there, but uh, we, we got your point. Thank you so much uh, for your comments. All right, just before we get some final thoughts, hopefully you have time for final thoughts, but on a lighter note, it was a, a witch's brew, as they say, enough to turn the stomachs of the most hardened economists, the financial turmoil, looming downgrades and stagnant growth. And back in 2018, I'm talking about, added the threat of quantitative easing, and it was a recipe for disaster. But instead of losing sleep, the keeper of the nation's purse at the time, was kept on stirring the pot. Here is our producer, Mark Ketlumotlave, cooking uh, former minister Tito Mbuweni's kitchen story. Take a look. So help me God. So help me God. It's a job nobody could be fighting for. Growing an economy decimated by wasteful expenditure and too many snouts in the trough. So when the going got tough, debt management strategies. the former finance minister went cooking. It was not going to rival Master Chef, but he did have a few tried and tested favorites. Chickens were free range, fresh from the garden into the pot, to be turned into Tito's famous chicken stew shared with thousands of followers some of whom just didn't hide their disdain and amazement at a table sometimes only set for one his culinary efforts gave rise to the hashtag titomboweni challenge and ex or twitter followers stepped up to the plate unfazed by naysayers the minister kept churning out hearty broths and stews the menu as unpredictable as the markets. So it turned out a bonus if you could source a local delicacy. But his weakness for tinned pilchards had some unintended consequences. A windfall for the manufacturer and elevated status for the chef, who could then choose between being the minister of pilchards or Mr. Lucky Star. He called cooking a stress relief. But was he fiddling in the kitchen while the country was burning? Well respected, his appointment to cabinet was welcome, but it kept getting hot and hot in the kitchen. However, he kept stepping up in vain. And now, stripped of the apron, he has stepped down from the kitchen's heat, his plate clean, and the meal will be served no longer. SABC News, Johannesburg.
Many thanks to Maka Ketla Matlapi there. And many thanks to my fellow colleagues here, Mzwai, Veli and Sophie. Value added, no doubt we've run out of time, but the conversations, as I always say, will continue as we explore very, every aspect of this man's life and what we can learn from it. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. All right, before we go, here's my take. Titan Baweni's passing gives us an opportunity to reflect, to reassess and to learn. It's about putting purpose to pain, right? And there's a blessing in that, why? Because he gave many a chance to understand what is real and what the next step should be, right? President Cyril Ramaphosa reminded us that Tito Mboweni distinguished himself from in, in, in different strategic roles in the private sector, and he was also a flag bearer in global forum for, for the country's economy, as you heard what Sophie had to say, in developing economies more broadly. So maybe, in passing from this life, some of his life's lessons can be passed on to the rest of us. And that's my take. If you missed anything on this program, then be sure to watch this episode of Topical on YouTube. Democracy 30 up next with Oliver Dixon. If you're watching a repeat of this program, then as always, the news continues. Until next week, my brothers and sisters, take care. Bye-bye.